After the Synod of 1532, the Church of the Alps had a period of comparative peace. This was a time of great spiritual prosperity, but their quickened zeal brought with it a revival of the persecutor's malignity. The martyrdoms of faithful Waldensians continued to testify against Rome until our inquisitors, the nuncio of the Pope, and the ambassadors of Spain and France united in urging upon King Philibert the purgation of his dominions. He was finally unable to withstand these powerful solicitations, and the tempest again burst upon Turin, the plain of Piedmont, and on to the Waldensian Alps, wherever it was known that there were Vaudois congregations. In 1655, with persecution again at its height, a number of Waldenses hid themselves in a cave in the mountains. Upon being discovered, they were taken to the top of Mount Castelluzzo and flung over the precipice. Mount Castelluzzo was the site of many atrocities. How often in days of old was the confessor hurled down its awful steep and dashed on the rocks at its foot? And there, commingled in one hideous heap, growing ever the bigger and ghastlier, as another and yet another victim was added to it, lay the mangled bodies of pastor and peasant, of mother and child. It was the tragedies connected with this mountain which called forth Milton's well-known sonnet. Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints, whose bones lie scattered on the alpine mountains cold. In thy book record their groans who were thy sheep, and in their ancient fold slain by the bloody Piedmontese that rolled mother with infant down the rocks. Their moans the veils redoubled to the hills, and they to heaven. Many gave their lives for the truths of God. We can only imagine what it was like to have lived in those days when persecution raged against God's truth. What was it like for those people taken up on that mount? History reveals that these people faced death with peace and courage and the hope of everlasting life. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The martyr's blood on the rocks has been repeated throughout the history of this world. There was blood on another rock. When Jesus died on the cross, he became the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And all those that have died martyr's deaths can look to that Lamb for eternal life. The Lamb in the midst of the throne, as it had been slain, is the focus of the entire Bible. The Waldensi martyrs had their eyes upon that lamb when they faced death. In God's great book of records, 1685 is a date recorded in infamy. King Louis XIV was nearing the grave. His life was full of sin and corruption. In order to appease his conscience, he inquired of his Catholic confessor what good deed he might do to atone for his many sins. The answer was ready. He must extirpate Protestantism in France. Louis did as he was commanded. He bowed before the shaven crowns of the priests and the Pope of Rome. Wishing companionship in the bloody war of purging France from Protestantism, King Louis sent an ambassador to the Duke of Savoy with the request that he deal with the Waldenses as he himself was now dealing with the Huguenots. The Duke of Savoy, Victor Amadeus, was young and naturally humane. 
Having respect for the Waldenses and their loyalty to his rule, he ignored the request of Francis King. Louis again wrote to the Duke of Savoy, threatening to do it for him with an army of 14,000 men and to keep the valleys for his pains. This was enough. A treaty was immediately arranged between the Duke and the French King, in which Louis promised an armed force to aid the Duke in forcing the Waldenses into subservience to Rome under pain of extermination. On the 31st day of January, 1686, the following edict was proclaimed in the valley. The Vaudois shall henceforth and forever cease and discontinue all the exercises of their religion. They are forbidden to have religious meetings under pain of death and penalty of confiscation of all of their goods. All their ancient privileges are abolished. All the churches, prayer houses, and other edifices consecrated to their worship shall be razed to the ground. All the pastors and schoolmasters of the valleys are required either to embrace Romanism or to quit the country within 15 days under pain of death and confiscation of goods. All the children born or to be born of Protestant parents shall be compulsorily trained up as Roman Catholics. Every such child yet unborn shall, within a week after its birth, be brought to the cure of its parish and admitted of the Roman Catholic Church under pain on the part of the mother of being publicly whipped with rods and on the part of the father of laboring five years in the galleys. The Vaudois pastors shall abjure the doctrine they have hitherto publicly preached, shall receive a salary greater by one-third than that which they previously enjoyed, and one-half thereof shall go in reversion to their widows. All Protestant foreigners settled in Piedmont are ordered either to become Roman Catholics or to quit the country within 15 days by a special act of his great and paternal clemency, the sovereign will permit persons to sell in this interval the property they may have acquired in Piedmont, provided the sale be made to Roman Catholic purchasers. This was war to the knife. O Messa, O Morte, go to Mass or you die. Three times the victim sent humble supplications for mercy to Turin, but received no answer. On Good Friday of 1686, when the people were gathered in the church of Angronia, Pastor Arnaud prayed. My prayer is this. Lord Jesus, thou has suffered and died for us. Oh, give us the grace to suffer and die for thee. He who is faithful to the end shall be saved. Repeat after me. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. The fatal order was given on April 22, 1686. In one month, the valley was depopulated. Two armies, the French under General Catanet and the Piedmontese under Gabriel of Savoy, moved in concert against the martyr people. Some were burned alive, some flayed, Many hung in trees, others were thrown from precipices, while yet others were as targets for the soldiers. The larger part of their population did not survive. Forty-two men and a few women and children retired to the heights of one mountain 
and an equal number to another. They dwelt in caves and fed on wild herbs and the meat of wolves. The remaining 12 to 13,000 in the valley were driven like cattle to the prisons of Turin, 30 miles away. Over a thousand babies were torn from their mother's arms and dispersed in convents or Catholic families. Many of the adults were presented to King Louis XIV for the galleys at Marseille. Thousands died in the prisons of Turin, where they were heaped one upon another, fed on black bread and foul water, and made to sleep on bare bricks on the earth or wet straw, eaten up by vermin and left all night without a light, even when the sick were dying. They were melted by the heat in summer and frozen by the cold in winter, while the priests and nuns sought by every infamous means to convert them. Eventually, an order came, obtained by the entreaties of the faithful Swiss to liberate the survivors and send them over the mountains to a refuge in Switzerland. After indescribable suffering, the Waldensian survivors were released to climb the mountains to Switzerland in the dead of winter. Anything was better than the filth and disease that they experienced in Turin, and all were impatient to leave those terrible prisons. The order was read to them at five o'clock on a winter's evening. Weak and sick, they prepared to leave at night, dressed as they were in rags. Leaving immediately, they walked 10 or 12 miles that night. The bitter cold of the winter took its toll. The dawn's early light revealed the mountainside strewn with frozen corpses. The Waldensian martyrs loved not their lives unto the death. They died as overcomers and will receive the overcomers' reward. On that snowy mountain, they were covered with a mantle of snow and ice, white and deadly. But in the earth made new, they will be clothed with a garment of light, clean and white, the robes of Christ's righteousness. As Jesus died a martyr's death, so did great numbers of Waldenses, but they died in faith, claiming the promises of God. Hundreds died from exposure to freezing temperatures, being poorly clothed, and in a weakened condition. 3,000 reached Switzerland, but they were walking skeletons, weary, footsore, and famished. They were received with pity, love, admiration, and generosity. Shoes were given them immediately and woolen garments to protect them from the cold. They were taken joyfully to the homes of their friends, the Waldensian survivors were thankful for their deliverance, but they were also saddened that they were exiles from their own land. These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The valleys were left desolate, the churches destroyed, the houses burned, the mountains strewn with corpses. For three and a half years, from April 22, 1686 to 1689, the valleys of the Piedmont had no Bible read, heard no psalm sung, and had no prayer of their pure faith raised to God. No voices rang with joyful hymns of praise. A thrilling story of dedication and courage is seen in the glorious return of the Waldenses to their home in the Piedmont Valleys. Henry Arnaud, a Waldensian pastor who was pastoring in the valleys at the time of the 1686 persecution, at 40 years of age, led 900 Waldensian men over Lake Limon. After 10 days of fatigue, war, and pain on the mountains of Savoy, they reached the borders of their valleys. 
Upon arriving at the first town, they took down the door of a church to make a pulpit outside for Arnaud to preach from. But their enemy, the Duke of Savoy, rallied on by the Pope of Rome, came against the Waldensian soldiers and drove them back into the mountains, an army of 20,000 against 900. The Waldensian soldiers defended themselves on a mountain during the whole winter. In the providence of God, they found a crop of ungathered corn covered by snow. They were aided by the fogs, winds, rains, and snows, which, an enemy officer said, seemed to be at their command. For months, they resisted the attacks of the enemy, retreating from their barricades, fighting inch by inch, but at last, driven to the very summit of La Balsiglia, hope seemed lost. There, led by one of their captains, aided as often by a fog which hid them from their enemies, they escaped along the edge of a precipice. Eventually, a coalition, including Germany, Great Britain, Holland, and Spain, was formed to check the ambition of France. Three days were given to Victor Amadeus to choose to which side he would join himself. The Ligares or the King of France. Amadeus chose to join with the coalition and to break with King Louis. In this case, to whom could he so well commit the keys of the Alps? Then to the Vaudois, a people who had been so loyal and faithful to their sovereign. Ever ready to rally round the throne of their prince, the moment the hand of persecution was withdrawn, the Waldenses accepted the peace offered them. Their towns and lands were restored. Their churches were reopened for Protestant worship. Their brethren still in prison at Turin were liberated. Their countrymen in Germany had passports to return to their homes. Thus, after a dreary interval of three and a half years, the valleys were again peopled with their ancient race and resounded with their ancient songs of praise. Though the Waldenses were given back their land as well as certain privileges, they were shut up in their mountains without civil rights. They were the Perias and outcasts of Italy. A Waldensian could not exercise a learned profession or take a regular course of study in the universities of Italy or worship according to his faith outside of the valleys. It was not until 1848 that the Waldenses were finally given their full civil rights and liberties. The years of persecution and diplomatic negotiations with the Italian government had taken their toll. Much of their ancient apostolic heritage had been lost. Many of their beliefs were compromised. Total dependence upon the word of God gave way to the traditions of men, and their missionary zeal for the pure, unadulterated gospel truth was gone. The Waldenses were caught up in a surge of ecumenism which swept through Italy and various parts of Europe during the mid-1800s. At the very time this celebration of coming together in liberty and brotherly love was occurring, the whole world was experiencing a great awakening to the second coming of Christ and a call to keep God's Ten Commandments, especially the Fourth Commandment, the Seventh Day Sabbath. While the remnant of the Waldenses were laying down the banner, compromising their ancient apostolic faith, God was raising another people. Through the great awakening of the Advent movement, many were coming together to proclaim the second coming of Christ and to continue the unbroken chain of entering into that rest, keeping the seventh day Sabbath and honoring all of his commandments. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The remnant people of God are to endure persecutions, as did the Waldenses. 
They are to give the warning message against the power represented by the beast of Revelation 13. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. The influence of Papal Rome in the countries that once acknowledged her dominion is still far from being destroyed, and prophecy foretells a restoration of her power. We have seen this being fulfilled today in the fall of Soviet communism and the resurgence of Catholic dominance under Pope John Paul II. The Baltic states, Poland, and Ukraine have broken away from communist rule and are returning to the teachings of Papal Rome. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Roman Catholicism has never before received the acceptance of the Protestant world as it has today. Protestants are no longer protesting. Protestantism is changing and is forming a confederacy with the man of sin, the papacy under the Pope of Rome. At the close of this world's history, there will be a final attack on God's people. The remnant church will stand united in the truth against the flood of error that Satan will cast against them. They will keep the commandments of God and cherish his seventh day Sabbath. The book of Revelation tells of two women. Chapter 12 portrays a pure and holy woman, symbolizing the people of God. Chapter 17 depicts a corrupt woman, representing a false religious system. This woman is arrayed in purple and scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, and has a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. No other power could be so truly declared drunken with the blood of the saints as that power which has so cruelly persecuted the followers of Christ. The history of the Waldenses is a prime example of how this apostate system destroys all those that do not conform to her dogmas. Today, Protestant America is no longer protesting against the errors of Roman Catholicism. The church is again uniting with the secular governments. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. What does the future hold for God's people? The persecutions and atrocities of the past are forgotten. Can we remain silent at this time in history? Great and solemn events are taking place all about us. Before us is the prospect of war, the risk of imprisonment, the loss of property and even life itself. To defend the law of God, which is being made void by the laws of men. The persecutions visited for many centuries upon this God-fearing people were endured by them with a patience and constancy that honored their Redeemer. Scattered over many lands, they planted the seeds of the Reformation that began in the time of Wycliffe, grew broad and deep in the days of Luther, and is to be carried forward to the close of time by those who also are willing to suffer all things for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, 
to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city.